Hello, everyone. Today, I'm speaking with five-time consecutive Mr. Olympia champion, Chris Bumstead. And so what do we talk about? Well, we talk about the utility of aiming at something high and pursuing it, um, the opportunity cost that comes along with that, the challenge of balancing that kind of single-minded and maybe necessary obsession with developing everything else that makes for a full life. We talk a lot about marriage and about how he's integrated his relationship into his into his high-level professional pursuits. Chris, his wife, is having a baby very soon. We talked a fair bit about parenthood, we talked about the role that his father played in his life. Um, we talked about his the pleasure he takes in and has discovered in being a role model, in sharing his disciplined journey towards a pinnacle with his followers. We talked about his practice of identifying the things that are impediments to his progress forward, his fears, his insecurities, his insufficiencies, his determination to face those things voluntarily, his ability to overcome those impediments as a consequence. That was particularly relevant on the public speaking and social engagement front, the way that him and his wife have negotiated that within the confines of the relationship, and um, his, his plans for the future that continues after his stellar athletic and public career comes to its particular close. So join us for that. So you made your debut on the professional stage at in 2017. How old, how old were you then? In 2017, I was 22 years old. 22. Okay, so like I'm very ignorant about the domain of activity that you are engaged in. So I'm going to ask all sorts of stupid questions and to, to catch myself up. So what did it mean to, what does it mean to debut professionally in the, in the, in the world of bodybuilding? And, and maybe you could also tell us about that world in general. I don't understand its structure or, or you know, the, the hierarchies of competition, how you move up and all of that. Like, what sort of world is that? Yeah, so it's, there's an, mainly just an amateur and a professional league. And it changed a lot over the years where it used to be a much bigger deal if you turn pro. And you call it getting your pro card in bodybuilding. So you compete as an amateur, usually in your city and then in your state. And then you'll do a national level show, and that's all as an amateur. And typically, when you win a national level show, you'll get your pro card. And then when you're a pro, that puts you into a brand new division where you're starting back from ground zero, and you're competing against usually older people who have been in there a lot longer, competing in the pro for years. And there's multiple pro shows around the country and around the world all year. And each one of those shows qualifies you to compete at the Olympia. And the Olympia is like the Super Bowl, just like the Olympia. It's the end-all, be-all of bodybuilding. So that's the goal that everybody is chasing at the end of the day. Okay, so the so Olympia is the Olympia is the pit, the pinnacle, and you yeah. won five consecutive championships. And is that the right terminology? Even to, uh, to, did you? Like, is it a championship that you win? What? Yeah. What's what? What's a? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, and that you can was call it whatever pinnacle. you want, but but yeah. So I had won five Olympias over the last five years. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And are you the and are you the current holder of the title? That's correct. Yeah. The five yes. previous. Okay, years, okay, yeah. good. Good, good, good. Just one of and has anybody else managed that for five years in a row? No. So it's actually a pretty new division I'm in. So that's another different tier that's within bodybuilding. There's open bodybuilding, which is there's no weight limit. Oh. And those are like the people like Ronnie Coleman and the huge people that a lot of people know the big names of. And there's no weight limit there. And I'm in a division called Classic Physique which is meant to bring back more of like the Arnold days, a little bit more aesthetic and not quite as big. So I have a weight cap that I have to match. So my division's only been around since 2016. So there were two previous winners before me over the three years, but the division's only been around for eight years. And I've won five of those eight years. So no one's really had a chance to beat that. Oh, okay, okay. So I was noticing, yeah, with regard to weight, I was noticing, I don't know how accurate Wikipedia is, but it listed your weight... Um, as 234, but in the off-season as 264. That's pretty so, accurate, yeah. Oh, okay. So what's what's the reason for the discrepancy there? 
So in bodybuilding, it's all about like bulking and cutting mainly. You spend a majority of your year trying to put on muscle. And to do so, you need to put on a little bit more body fat, eat more food, train a little bit more intense, do less cardio so your body's growing. And then when you enter prep, which is like the big thing of bodybuilding, you enter like a 12 to 16 week prep, which is very strict dieting. And its whole intention of that is stripping as much fat as possible while maintaining as much muscle as possible. And so that's where the weight fluctuates. So you want to get to a healthy body fat, but a higher weight to put on some muscle. And then you chop that down. And that's where the weight discrepancy comes in. So I'll be 265-ish at my highest. And I'll come down to about 240 when I'm right on stage. Okay. And that's and that's to 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 make the most of your to make the most of your shape for the competition, I presume, to make you to make you as cut as you can be for the purposes of the display. Is that is that the case? Exactly. Yeah. It's like chiseling down a stone, down to the all the excess stone, bring it down to just the art of it. Right, right, right. And so when you're in that 12 to 16 week period, what what do you do on the diet front? What do you have to do in order to lose that 30 pounds and what what does your diet regimen consist of? Um, it typically consists of you start building up to a maximum amount of calories as you can throughout the year so your metabolism is flying. And then when you start prep, you just slowly start bringing down the calories while increasing the amount of cardio you do. So let's say in my off-season when I'm at my heaviest, I'm eating about 5,500, 5,000 calories. And then at my lowest, at the end of my prep, I'll be eating about 1,500 calories. So it comes down quite a bit. And within that, you're adding in cardio, so you're expending a little bit more calories doing that. And it's just kind of changing the energy output versus input to make sure that you're inputting less than you're outputting. I see. So it's basically, it's not so much, if I if I have this correct, it's not so much what you're eating at that point. It's how it's how much you're eating, essentially assessed by by caloric intake. I mean, exactly. I, I'm curious about this because, as you perhaps know. No, I have a almost entirely carnivorous diet and have for a long time. And I've been watching Sean Baker a, a lot on, on especially on his Twitter feed, doctor who's been promoting the carnivore diet. And um, it seems to be unbelievably useful for adding muscle mass, but also decreasing body fat content. So I was curious about, you know, the, the ratio of carbohydrates to proteins or if, if there's anything additional that you're doing apart from adjusting caloric intake per se. Yeah, yeah. So typically there's like a set amount of protein people will eat and it stays around then. So I'll eat about 300 grams of protein in a day. And as my calories come down, I'm normally pulling away my carbs and my fats and keeping my protein the same. So calories are coming down, but protein staying the same. So that ratio just changes. And that's why bodybuilding is a so much different than a lot of other sports, if you can call it that, because it's not just about how you perform, but it's about how you look. So typically in sports, it's like, what's going to allow me to perform the best? Whereas in bodybuilding, it's like, no, I've just got to look the best. And then I still have to go and perform in the gym as best as I can. So it's kind of balancing those two to allow yourself to be in the gym, getting the best workouts and you can. But you also can't be eating too much to perform at your best because then you'll be holding on too much body fat. So it's kind of an art of balancing all that. Right, right. Okay, so so let's go through the progression of your career from amateur to professional. And then I would like also to talk about the criteria by which you're by which you're judged exactly what it is that the judges are looking for. We could talk a little bit about the popularity of the the sport as well. So, you said when you were an amateur, there are local comp. So, what exactly are the structures of the competitions, and how popular is this? So, you started. I, I believe you started weightlifting when you were about fourteen. Is that is that correct? Yeah, it was right around then. Yeah. Okay, and 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 why did you start? when you were 14 and what was the consequence of starting? Um, I just started, I started in the gym because I played a lot of sports and I was very mm. athletic, but I wasn't really good at the skill of the sports. So I played hockey, basketball, football, but I wasn't great at dribbling or shooting, but I was really fast and strong. So I ended up kind of sticking to what I like. You know, I knew I was good at strength. I was good in the gym. So I started doing that more and more. And I just had a passion for that. I slowly built that. And as I started to, as sports get progressively more competitive, I started to kind of get pushed out of that. But I noticed I had a lot of, a lot of unique skills in the gym, if you will. So I started to excel very well in that above a lot of people. And of course, at a young age, when you're starting to get attention from girls and see some excess and put on some muscle and all that, you start to enjoy that a little bit more. It makes you like the training in the gym even more. So I put more and more focus into that, started nailing my diet, my nutrition, training, everything like that. 
And then it was when I was in grade 12, my sister started dating a local bodybuilder and they're actually married now. He's my brother-in-law. And he started coaching me into the, the true realm of bodybuilding. Because before that, I was just training to be strong. I didn't understand bodybuilding to, to how precise it really was. So he started teaching me the intricacies, intricacies of that. And he saw the potential in me. He's like, you're young. I was 18 years old, had a lot of muscle on me. He's like, you should try doing a bodybuilding show. I'll coach you. We'll see how it goes. Have some fun with it. Why not? Oh, yeah. So I was like, sure, okay, you so, know, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Okay, so, yeah. okay. So let's let's walk into the practicalities of that because there there will be lots of people who are watching and listening who, in principle, would like to discipline themselves. In principle, they'd like to hit the gym and, you know, undergo some physical transformation to make themselves stronger and healthier and more attractive. And like I started weightlifting when I was about, let's see, 21, 22, something like that. I was very, very thin and not very strong. And I I packed on about 35 pounds of muscle in about two years. I had to eat like a mad dog to do that. And um, there's a reason I'm telling you this. I mean, one because it did a lot of things for me that I didn't understand that weightlifting would do. Now, I used free weights. And one of the things I noticed, apart from the fact that I packed on muscle and was stronger, was that my posture improved a lot. I was starting to get hunched a little bit because I was type sitting and writing a lot. And it pulled my shoulders back up straight. And then it was really good for my coordination, especially my lower body. Uh, my legs got a lot more coordinated. And uh, the other thing it did was produce, and I think this went along with the coordination, and maybe that was from working all the little tendons and so forth that you do with free weights. It also made me a lot more physically, like, confident. And I think, I don't think that was nearly as much a consequence of the strength as it was a consequence of the increased coordination. Okay, so back when you were 14, you were already athletic. You started, but you started hitting the gym more thoroughly. What, what, like what size were you? What height were you when you were 14? How were you built physically when you were, when you were, you know, that young a uh, teenager? I don't remember my exact size, but I was like a lean, skinny kiddish. I was probably like just under six foot maybe 180 pounds, 170 pounds or so. So I was never really small. And even when I graduated right, high school, right. I was about 220 pounds. So definitely noticed some of the same things as yourself. I was definitely a bit of an anxious kid, quiet and introvert. And going in the gym by myself, playing some music, just enjoying that allowed me to like control the outcome of all that. And it was really fun for me. And obviously, like you said, you noticed as well, it builds confidence in you. Even just being good at something can build confidence in you. So obviously that was that was part of what I started to do. And like I said, you get a little attention from having some muscle at a young age and that builds a little bit more confidence. And all these things started kind of trickling in my mind being like, oh wow, I really like this. I should keep doing. If I do more of it, I'll get more of these good feelings from it. Right. Okay. So, so you were a pretty big kid. You were, you're already six feet tall. You're, you're, and you're pretty built. I mean, 180 and six feet at 14. You, so you had, it's no, okay. So you had the natural physique for this. And then how, how did you start? Like, had you been a disciplined kid up to then? How had you done in school? Like, were, were you someone who had regular and good habits? Were you a conscientious person to begin with? You know, I'm kind of wondering how you managed mm -hmm. to develop the discipline to start working out in the gym and how regularly were you walk me through how you learned to do this and and step by step so that people listening could figure out for themselves what they would do if they decided to go to the gym and also the obstacles you know when i went to the gym i went at mcgill and like i said i was very thin i was about six feet tall but about 135 pounds like very very thin and not very strong. And one of the obstacles to me of being in the gym was that it's 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 embarrassing even to some degree to recount because when I was there, people would come over and show me how to use the weights. And you know, that that's friendly, but it's also mm -hmm. very annoying. And I think I was bench pressing like 75 pounds with some difficulty at that point. And so, you know, that's not very much weight. And so one of the things you can imagine that when people are going to hit the gym, there's there's a couple of, especially if they haven't been athletic, there's a couple of things that are going to be impediments. They're going to be self-conscious. They don't know what the hell they're doing. Plus, hypothetically, they, lo they lack discipline. Now, you had the advantages of being slightly, you know, somewhat on the larger side and also being athletic. But how did you develop the discipline and what impediments did you have to overcome as you were developing that discipline? Yeah, so, I mean... 
I heard a quote the other day that stuck with me because it thought of me of this. It was, you don't start something because you're passionate. You stick with it because you're passionate. So I kind of just started it. I fell into it naturally. And like I said, as I started to see results and get a little bit more joy out of it, I started to become more passionate and put more effort into it. And every year since I was a child, I've become a little bit more consistent, a little bit more passionate, and put a little bit more effort into it. So my discipline has continued to grow over time because I just stuck with something for a while and want to see how it went, and it just kind of tumble affected. But I definitely had some of the similar feelings, and I hear it from everybody about being a little anxious, being in the gym. And it's funny. it's People will come help you to make you feel comfortable, but like you said, it can almost be demeaning, make you feel a little bit like, all right, you think I need your help? But when I was right, young— right, right. Yeah. So my dad actually had one of those old sand weights. It was like a weeder bar with sand weights in the basement. And I remember right, setting right. up some boxes, filling them up with stuff and lying on it and trying to bench press on it because it's hard to balance a bench press at first. Like you talked about the stability right, right. and all that. It's difficult. So I was a young kid in my basement doing that with push-ups and pull-ups. And that's really what got me into the whole weightlifting, building muscle thing. And that was purely, like I mentioned, just to get better at sports. I assumed if I was stronger, I would be better at sports. And then after that, I joined a gym at a young age. It was a summer program that gave kids a free membership over the summer. And I had to ask my parents to come sign me up because you had to be 16 and I was 14. So they had to come in and sign a waiver for that. And it's, I wasn't the most disciplined kid for sure. My parents definitely made me independent and to, to have some of the free reign that they gave me to be able to go out with friends and do stuff. I had to earn it. I had to have a job, finish my chores, do my homework and all that stuff. So my parents definitely raised me to have that kind of mindset and I grew up in a town with some good kids. Luckily, didn't get stuck into anything bad. And we were all very, all my friends were very passionate about sports and I wanted to excel. So I kept putting myself in the gym. And at a young age, I remember I didn't have a car or any way to get there all the time. My parents would work late. And I remember I would run even in the winter in Ottawa. It would be like a foot of snow on the ground and I'd be jogging to the gym. It was about a mile and a half, but still a decent little run in the snow. And I was just super dedicated from a young age because I loved it so much and as I mentioned, sometimes just being in the gym with my music and that focus was just like a point of solitude for myself to enjoy. And there was a quiet gym, luckily, and I, I slowly learned over time that no one in the gym is looking at you or judging you. Everybody who's everybody who's been in there was a beginner at some point, so they're not looking at you, making fun of you. They were you probably a year or two ago, and everyone's just truly there to help out. And I've discovered that the fitness community in general is a very encouraging community, because everybody has the same experience as you. They get in, they feel better, they get some confidence. And they're like, this is great. Like, I would love for other people to feel this too, you hope, if they're nice enough. And that typically allows them to be very inclusive and want people to come and join and just be a part of it all. So I found it's not a judgmental as people think when once you're in it. Right. Well, that's a really good that's a really good point, you know, because part of being self-conscious in the gym is, and this is true for overweight people and for anybody who's out of shape or for anybody who just doesn't know what they're doing, which is pretty much everybody when they go to the gym the first time, especially if they don't have, a, as we pointed out, a history of athleticism. It's very easy to think that these people who are throwing the weights around in there are judgmental. You know, it's really a consequence of your own self-consciousness and and proclivity to, to self-judgment. But, you know, the fact that those people are in there working on themselves does indicate very clearly through their actions that they believe that they still have work to do. And as you said, the probability that many of them who are in there, or perhaps all of them to some degree, were in the same boat as you at some point is very, very high. You know, and it was certainly the case that the people who were coming over to help me weren't doing it in a judgmental way. You know, that was my problem. And there's another thing to, to concentrate on there too. You know, one of the things that one of my favorite thinkers, um, psychoanalyst Carl Jung pointed out, it was very, very helpful to me to understand, was that he said the precursor to the redeemer is the fool. And what he meant by that was that if you're going to master something, the first thing you have to do is admit to yourself that you're not a master of it already, because then you wouldn't have to do anything. So, you have to allow yourself to be the fool. And, you know, one of the things I've noticed about people who are highly successful, is that they will jump into new things that they don't know anything about and be the fool, be the person who doesn't know anything, be the person who's low man on the totem pole, start at the lowest rung, and they won't pretend to know more than they do know. They ask the stupid questions that are necessary. They humble themselves in accordance with their 
novice position. They like they accept that weight, and but they also do so in the understanding that if they're honest with themselves, they can make the kind of incremental progress that you described, right? Because you said you got more and more disciplined as the years went by, and that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you start at the bottom. What matters is that you're so stupid and blind that you refuse to learn and that you stay there, right? So it's it's trajectory that matters and not absolute position. And so that's a useful thing for people to know. It's like, of course, you feel like a bloody fool when you do something the first time. What the hell do you expect? Mm-hmm. Like, you are a fool, but that doesn't sure. mean that you can't you can't move beyond that. Yeah, yeah, no, you touched on something great there when you're expanding. If it's something that makes you feel worried or anxious or you're thinking other people are judging you, it's probably actually a reflection of yourself, something that you need to grow on. And that's something that I really noticed because I used to be super anxious in public speaking. And I remember you've done a lot of talks on fear immersion and stepping into it and the confidence that can build. And I didn't really understand this whole mindset of all the confidence that would come from that. And I, but I would always do podcasts or public speaking, or I started to get in some uh, seminar events or being asked to come talk for my success as a bodybuilder. And every time I went there, I'd be Mr. Olympia walking into this thing, terrified out of my mind, like hands shaking, stumbling my words. And I still feel like that sometimes, but I've gotten better. But I realized I took a step back after a few times. I'm like, all right, this is something I need to put myself into more to become better at it. And I started to actually plan my events to be more talking based, sign up for a few more requests to talk a little bit more in front of people. And it was terrifying at first and I still embarrass myself sometimes. I still have memories standing on stage stuttering or my list comes out really bad and feeling embarrassed and getting off stage. But I also have a lot of memories now where I've killed a good talk and I've stepped off stage feeling so confident. And over that realm of me becoming better at something I wasn't good at, I noticed my confidence in all aspects of my life started to increase, not just in public speaking. So I think that being able to have that humility, like you said, look at yourself, be the fool, and understand where you need to grow and put yourself into positions to grow is something that has helped me immensely and something I've taken from some of your words in the past too. 